Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Today's devotional, Speaking in Tongues. I think everyone just kind of got tense for a second, but it's not going to be this guy's I think it's actually going to be pretty cool. I won't be battling any gibberish today, so, so don't worry about that. And this is actually not my current devotional, but it is one I spent quite a few weeks on a while back, and I want to share what I learned during that with all you guys today. Uh, this presentation is also a smaller piece of a much larger one than we're going to put together on the charismatic movement, so I will, we'll be keeping it focused on speaking in tongues today, but um, there's a bunch of other stuff that we can go into with it as well, eventually. Now you may be asking yourselves, why should we be concerned with the charismatic movement and the speaking in tongues? And the answer is that this is seeping into our church today, into the Adventist church. It was happening back in Ellen White's day, and it's still happening today. And we need to be ready to combat that which is not biblical with what the Bible says, amen? So that was kind of the whole purpose behind this. Now, I've got a little bit of experience in this area. While I myself have never babbled in the gibberish, I had a lot of friends who did. This is the cast from my first Christian film, and only about three of us were not Pentecostal or charismatic. Everyone else you see spoke in tongues. So I've heard it firsthand. I've even dated a Pentecostal girl. I've, I've been around this kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, before I moved up here to Montana, my friends asked if they could lay hands on me and pray for me. And I knew that they would be praying in tongues. And I said, Lord, if this is not from you, please protect me from whatever evil may be behind this. And so sure enough, they laid hands on me and started doing their thing. I didn't feel the Holy Spirit moving. I said, okay, I need to look at this a little bit more and figure out if this is from God or if it's not. Because right now I'm thinking it's not from God. And I need to know for sure and be able to talk to my friends about it as well, if that not be the case. So what follows is actually the study that I did on speaking in tongues. And um, hopefully it's educational and give you guys some tools that you can use to share with any of my friends that you may have. A word of warning, we'll be flying through the New Testament today, spending a lot of time in 1 Corinthians and in Acts. So please follow along. I'll, I'll have scripture on the screen, but if you've got a Bible, follow along in your personal devotional Bible, because it makes it that much more real. You'll know where things are, and it'll make you a much better witness for other people later on as well. And it helps double-check everything I'm saying to make sure that I'm on track, too. So when I started this out, I said, okay, I need to make an assumption. I need to figure out, first of all, if there is a gift of speaking in tongues, and if there is a gift, is that gift available for us as Christians today? So we're going to start with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. I don't have this bookmark, so I've got to find it live like you guys. First Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. The Bible says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, it's... Always a good idea to find more than one Bible verse. If you're trying to base doctrine on one verse, that's not a good idea. So let's go and look at another one. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, help, governments, diversities of tongues. There we go again. And if two is not enough for you, we'll find one more. 1 Corinthians 14, 39. It's just a page over for me here. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. So when I found these verses, I said, okay, there is a gift of speaking in tongues, and we are not to forbid that from taking place within the churches. So this raises some other questions that we'll be asking here in a few seconds. Now, there are some denominations out there that teach that the gift of tongues is available for every Christian, and that unless you speak in tongues, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. So I ask myself, is this scriptural, and is this biblical? And we get the answer in 1 Corinthians 12, 29 through 30. It says, Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? So, you know, it says, Are all, are all, are all. It's saying that not everybody has it. If we go up to the verse we already read, 12, 28, it says, And God has said, All in the church or some of the church? Some of the church. Not everybody has the gift of tongues. So I said, okay, if anybody's telling me that I've not received the Holy Spirit because I don't babble like they do, then they're lying to me because that's not biblical. And what does the Bible say about those that speak not according to the Word? There's no light in them. So that was kind of a real shocker for me when I came across that. So another question I asked myself, according to the Holy Scriptures, what is the gift of tongues? It is available. Is it this gibberish that we see or is it something else? 
Um, a lot of the Pentecostal Christians, charismatic Christians, would say that the word unknown, using some of the verses we've looked at and will continue to look at, means the language of angels. And they get that from 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. And so, they're, they're, again, they're taking one verse that talks about the tongues of angels, and they're saying, see, Paul spoke in the tongues of angels, and that's exactly what we're doing. Well, is that necessarily right? Because unfortunately, the word unknown that we see here in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that word is italicized. And that means it was not in the original text, which means you cannot find the definition of that in concordance. So to say that the unknown tongue is the tongues of angels is, where would they get based on that off? I don't know, that doesn't make sense to me. So what did Paul mean when he said he spoke in the tongues of men and of angels? If you read the next verse here, it's, so we read the first one, 13, 1. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So question, did Paul have all faith? Did he understand all mysteries of the world? No. So the word though simply means even if. So if we translate it, even if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, and becomes a sounding grass for the symbol, even if I have the gift of prophecy, even if I understand all mysteries. So... Did he speak in the tongues of angels? We don't know. The Bible doesn't actually tell us. It just says even if he did. When we stumble upon a tough concept in Scripture, you know, we're trying to figure out what this gift of tongues is, we're not getting it right here in the basic text. We need to go elsewhere. Should we let the pastors tell us what the interpretation is, or should we let the Bible interpret itself? I, I usually prefer to let the Bible interpret itself. It kind of works out usually a lot better. There are only three examples of speaking in tongues in the New Testament. It's mentioned many times, but there's only three examples. We find those in Acts chapters 2, 10, and 15. And we're only going to look at the ones in Acts chapter 2 today for the sake of time. But if you turn to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, the Bible says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard him speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue where we were born? We drop down a few more verses. Verses 11 and 12, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to one another, what means this? This is the first time speaking of tongues is recorded in the Bible. It doesn't sound like they were speaking gibberish of the toddler. No, it had a purpose to it. We'll look into that purpose here in a second. But first, God's prophet, Mrs. White, says, the Holy Spirit, assuming the form of tongues of fire, rested upon those assembled. This was an emblem of the gift that bestowed on the disciples, which enabled them to speak with fluency. That's my emphasis added. Languages which had heretofore been unacquainted. Acts of the Apostles, page 39. Now, this is great for those of us that believe in Mrs. White, but there are Adventists and other Christians that don't believe in Mrs. White. So we need to be able to prove from Scripture that this is just an unknown language that was being spoken. And when we look at verses 4 through 6, we actually get the what, the why, and the effect. Verse 4 gives us the why. They began to start the what? We, they began to speak with other tongues. Why did they do it? Because there were men gathered out of every nation under heaven. And the effect was that every man heard him speak in his own language. In fact, the word tongues is Strong's word 1100, and it simply means an earthly language. So another question I had to ask myself. Okay, I'm learning it's an earthly language, but there's still some people out there that claim it's a personal prayer language. Could, it, could speaking in tongues be referred to as praying in the spirit? We'll hear that term a lot when, when you interact with charismatic people. And the Bible said in verse 11, Acts... 2.11 says, We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. The purpose of speaking in tongues was to spread the gospel, not to be a personal prayer language between you and, and God. So now that we have a definition, let's go and jump back to 1 Corinthians 14 real quick. Hopefully we'll be flying around. In verses 12 to 14, it says, Even so, ye, for so much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, Seek that he may excel to the edifying of the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if someone is speaking in what is the biblical tongues, 
They, it must be a language that is understood. It must be understood by others, otherwise it is useless. In fact, we see that again in another verse. Uh, 14 verses 27 and 28. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So, keeping this all in mind, earthly language, purpose of spreading the gospel, not gibberish kind of stuff. I'm going to show a quick 30 second video of some teens speaking in tongues, as they call it today. I want you to ask yourselves, is this really what the gift that was manifest back at Pentecost? Corinthians 14, verses 33 and 40. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Let all things be done decently and in order. So with that in mind, can what we just saw truly be of God? I, I don't think so. So then another question I had asked myself, if this is not of God, then who or what is responsible for it? I did a little bit more digging, and it's a little known fact that the manifestation that is today called speaking in tongues actually originated from voodoo when someone would become possessed. It traveled to the United States via the slaves, and the slaves, wanting to be allowed to practice their religion, told their slave owners, their Christian slave owners, that it was the Holy Spirit working with them in them. And the slave owners were like, hey, we want the Holy Spirit too. And from there, it entered into our churches. As you can see from this photo, the uh, voodoo also introduces to the concept of being slain in the spirit, which is very big in the charismatic churches as well, which I won't be getting into today, but uh, rest assured it's not from God, the way that we hear about it being taught. So finally, I'd like to close with a few thoughts. The charismatic movement today, including the very thing that's entering into our churches, claiming these ecstatic utterances are assigned to unbelievers, or excuse me, are assigned to believers that they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. But the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So the charismatic churches today have completely flipped that around, because Satan has a counterfeit for everything, a way to deeply twist it and turns God's thing on its head. The counterfeit tongues is based on feeling and is ensnaring thousands of Christians today. On this matter, God's prophet said, Whenever and wherever the Lord works in giving a genuine blessing, a counterfeit is also revealed in order to make of none effect the true work of God. Therefore, we need to be exceedingly careful and walk humbly before God, that we may have spiritual eyes solved, and that we may distinguish the working of the Holy Spirit of God from the working of the Spirit that would bring in wild fruits, or wild vices and fanaticism. By their fruits we shall know them, Matthew 7, 20. And that's from Selected Messages, Book 1, page 142. Back in Ellen White's time, there was a church in Maine where this was becoming extremely popular. And if you have the Ellen White app or the Ellen White CD and you type in gibberish, doing a topical search, you get one hit. And this is the, that hit, the one I'm about to read you right now. It says, some of these persons have exercises which they call gifts and say that the Lord has placed them in the church. They have an unmeaning gibberish, which they call the unknown tongue. And I love this part, which is unknown not only by man, but by the Lord in all heaven. Such gifts are manufactured by men and women, aided by the great deceiver. Fanaticism, false excitement, false talking in tongues, and noisy exercises have been considered gifts which God has placed in the church. Some have been deceived here. The fruits of all this have not been good. You shall know them by their fruits. Fanaticism and noise have been considered special evidences of faith. Some are not satisfied with the meeting unless they have a powerful and a happy time. The work of this, they work for this and get up an excitement of feeling. But the influence of such meetings is not beneficial. When the happy flight of feeling is gone, they sink lower than before the meeting because their happiness did not come from the right source. 
The most profitable means for spiritual advancement are those which are characterized with solemnity and deep searching of heart, and earnestly and deep humility seeking to learn of Christ. Volume 1 Testimonies, page 412, paragraph 1. So we've covered a lot of ground, and like I said, this was just the study that I did. It's more than enough proof for me that when people say they're speaking in tongues, I always want to say, well, what do you mean by that? And if they start manifesting what we saw in that video, we need to pray that God allows us to very humbly share with them the, the truth from the scriptures. So I hope you guys have been somewhat educated on this now, and thank you very much.